My name is Richard Joy, and I'm the Executive Director of the Urban Land Institute, ULI Toronto. And on behalf of our Programming Committee and our Management Committee, it is my pleasure to welcome you all here to our seventh annual, needless to say, sold out, 2015 Fireside Chat with Toronto's newly elected Mayor, John Tory, in conversation with John Duffy. To begin, I would like to thank this evening's sponsors, without whom this evening would not be possible. So please join me in thanking our event sponsors tonight, who are Bell, CBRE, and Daniels. Thank you very much. A special thank you to Bell, who in addition to being our sponsor, have purchased 13 tickets so that we could invite some lucky students uh, here tonight at no cost. So thank you, uh, Bell, for this. This is a wonderful thing that you've done. And I will soon be calling on Moral uh, Pemiyanki, who is the Executive Pre President and Chief Development Officer of Smart Urban, a smart centers company, who will be formally introducing tonight's fireside chat guests. Smart Urban is this evening's presenting sponsor, and we thank them for their generous support. Thank you. I also want to briefly acknowledge two VIPs. Uh, the first one, I believe, is the only other sitting politician in this room other than the mayor, and that is Councillor Gary Crawford. Councillor, thank you for being here. If I'm mistaken, please stand up. <laughs> um, the other one I have to acknowledge, as this is uh, her home, and that is uh, Jan De Silva, who's the president and CEO of the Toronto Region Board of Trade. Um, who in, who in the spirit of, of urban renewal is another new face uh, for us uh, in, the, in the urban mix and a welcome one and doing a fantastic job in your early weeks, so thank you for having us here. Before we continue, I want to, though, acknowledge on a sad note the death uh, this week of uh, Barry Lyons. Um, Barry was a regular attendee of these fireside chats and a past panelist of ours and obviously a giant in the planning and development community of our city. A celebration of Barry's life with the promise of laughter at his request is planned for the evening of April 13th at the Four Seasons Opera House, and we'll make sure you have those details. But on behalf of ULI Toronto, I would like to extend our condolences to Barry's family, his friends, and his colleagues. I know a number of them are here in this room tonight. He will be missed. Over the years, these fireside chats have given our audience a unique insight into the personalities of our regional leaders. Our fireside chats have served to provide an interesting retrospective on the lives and careers of some of our most noteworthy region builders. Only once before, though, have we featured a sitting politician, and that was two years ago when Mayor Hazel McCallion, then Mayor Hazel McCallion, graced our stage in conversation with Toronto's chief planner, Jennifer Kiesmatt, who is also here, Jennifer. Um, but never before have we featured a politician at the beginning of his or her mandate. This is a first for us. So that's, while we look forward to learning a little more about the life and career of a man who has been in the public eye for decades, we are obviously equally interested to hear what lies ahead for Toronto's 65th mayor. Before I ask Morrill to formally introduce the mayor, allow me a few words to set up the stage a little bit. John Tory takes over the helm of Toronto City Hall at a particularly important moment for our city and our region. My emphasis on region speaks to a very important context point. Without a, John, without a doubt, John Tory is the first post-amalgamation Toronto mayor who truly gets the importance of not just being the mayor of our city, but also a regional leader. I suspect that John Duffy will expand on this topic, so I won't need to say much more on that, other than to say that the, for the land use community, the regional focus is a very important one for us. Another important point of context relates to the mayor's uh, signature policy priority, Smart Track. Obviously, Smart Track serves to address the city's re and the region's most pressing economic challenge, gridlock. It is about moving people and ultimately goods faster. It is the cornerstone of his transportation agenda. But importantly, Smart Track is also a land use focus. Mayor John Tory has clearly linked the need to leverage increased land values associated with this major public infrastructure investment as part of his investment strategy. 
And just as a, as a quick aside, as, as many of you will know, we often do uh, member-only events following our major events, and we have one coming forward, and that will be called the Smarts Behind Smart Track, uh, and that will be led by Ian Dobson, uh, the architect I'm calling him, and the vision uh, around the vision around Smart Track. I believe Ian is here. Don't see him, but uh, there he is. So uh, we'll be giving you more details about that, but we're hoping that's going to be March 24th. I believe that fits Ian's calendar. Um, so that look for that on our website very soon, as in the next coming days. But lastly, I would like to uh, also note that Mayor John Tory is the first Toronto mayor to live in a condo. Uh, <laughs> so how does this impact the city in which we live in today? And, and, and how does it impact the city that we're building tomorrow from his perspective? So finally, tonight's uh, uh, event has generated a lot of social media buzz, and I want to thank especially our communications committee for this. Over the last couple of weeks, we have been engaging the broader community to ask questions of the mayor on uh, Twitter through our hashtag AskMayorTO. Uh, there it is right there. So you can do that over the course of the night, and we'll be looking to uh, uh, bring some of the questions up to John to ask of the mayor uh, at the end of this session. But without further ado, I would like to now welcome to the podium Mario Pambianchi, Executive Vice President, Chief Development Officer of Smart Urbans, a smart centers company, to formally introduce the Mayor Mauro. Thank you, Richard. It's a great pleasure for me to be here and to have the honor of uh, introducing our distinguished guests. It promises to be an interesting and wide-ranging discussion about the future of our great city. John Duffy, I don't have to identify which one is which. Uh, John Duffy, who's principal of Strategy Corp, one of Canada's leading government relations and public affairs consultants, and he's probably well known to many of you in the room. Prior to, fo prior to founding Strategy Corp, John worked at the federal level for the Right Honorable Paul Martin and interim leader Bob Ray, John was also a strategic campaign advisor to Premier Kathleen Wynne, and he played an integral part in Mayor Tory's successful mayoral campaign. Heading up the policy team with particular focus on the proposed Smart Track Transit Initiative. Our mayor, of course, needs no introduction. We see him on the news every night, speaking passionately about the city. He loves our city, his city. He seems to be everywhere. And at times, I find it difficult to imagine how one person can attend so many events, chair so many meetings, and engage so many residents. We know about his work ethic. He's known for starting work early in the morning and working till late at night. And I think some of us still chuckle the first week when he was at City Hall and they had to reprogram the computers to turn the lights on at 6.30 in the morning when the mayor arrived. And I think we all know quite a bit about his illustrious uh, career in business and in public service. Prior to the election, uh, Mr. Tory had a successful career in, uh, as a lawyer, sorry, in law, in business with Rogers. Uh, in provincial politics, he was a CFL commissioner a leader in various civic groups, and of course, a radio host. But I think all of those were a warm up for the challenging job that he has today. Since starting the job four months ago, the mayor has proven himself to be a man of action. Small and large, from traffic to frozen pipes, or today's topic, hydro blackouts. I heard you on the radio on the way down. One highly visible one is his initiative of uh, towing illegally parked vehicles on major thoroughfares during rush hour, which uh, I think has been uh, quite a success from what I've heard. And it has put the mayor in good stead with many Torontonians who, as you know, complain in equal measure about traffic and the Maple Leafs. <laughs> so, Mr. Mayor, one down, one to go. Um, on behalf of ULI, please welcome John Duffy and Mayor John Torrey. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Mauro. I really appreciate it. Um, and, and I want to say on, on a personal note, as, as, as one of the uh, former campaign team uh, that, that helped uh, Mayor Tory, we were very grateful to Smart Centers and Smart Urban for not suing the heck out of us um, when our advertising team plagiarized your signature, uh, your signature prefix um, for, for our signature transit proposal. So, so mille grazie. Um, <laughs> I, I, I just want to briefly add my voice to, 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 to those expressing condolences about the passing of Barry Lyons. Um, I, I'm not a member of your community, obviously. I'm a guest here, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be here. But um, even people well outside uh, the development community knew and, and respected the esteem in which all of you held Barry Lyons. He was a real city builder. Uh, I think that's the highest tribute that this outsider can pay. And so uh, on behalf of the whole city, we feel your loss as a community. I want to add my voice, and I'm sure the mayor will to those expressing condolences. Um, one of the things I'm going to do tonight, I'm going to try to conduct a bit of a conversation with Mr. Torrey, which is easy, um, because he is known for his brief, laconic <laughs> remarks that make the interviewer carry all the work. Um, and uh, that's, that's as We're it should be. We're off to a bad start here. <laughs> and, um, but uh, part of my job is to introduce uh, someone who needs no introduction, so just very briefly. Uh, this is a gentleman who uh, ha was born recently in the then much smaller city of Toronto. Um, when it was, I would say, about a quarter of its current size, between a quarter and a third of its current size. Uh, he's really grown up with this place. Uh, he went to a, a, uh, a, a modest uh, startup institution uh, for high school and then another modest, equally venerable startup institution called Trinity College. Uh, moved swiftly and distinguishedly uh, into law school. Uh, at the other place at Osgoode and was called to the Bar of Ontario in 1980. Somewhere along the way, he managed to muck about in almost every significant political event of the 1970s from uh, working with Premier Davis and, and being around for the stopping of the Spadina Expressway, which is a seminal and still lively discussion topic in the life of the city, right through to rent control, through to all of the city shaping experiences that happened uh, under Mayor Crombie. And I have to say, personally, for me, the proudest moment of the campaign uh, was when uh, David Crombie came out uh, and, and supported John Tory uh, in the campaign's dying days. That, that for me was a completion, which was difficult for a former annex New Democrat to admit, but it, it, made, it made me very happy. Professionally, uh, John has, uh, Mauro explained some of the highlights, but anyone who's been a lawyer at a, at a, at a top drawer Bay Street law firm, who's also run the CFL, uh, and who has also run uh, a cable co through tough times, and run the Progressive Conservative Party of Ontario uh, is really ready for City Hall. Um, there's, there's, uh, not sure the trajectory is going the right way, but but the the, the the preparedness is very clearly there. It's, it's the unceasing adulation that goes with all those jobs. That's very the clearly, I'm here to do that. that. Stops. Um, it's excellent. In politics, uh, look, John, John Tory's political career has been, if anything, more illustrious than than his uh, than his business and professional career. I mean, working as principal secretary to one of the great premiers of this province, uh, William Granville Davis, um, serving uh, in Mr. Davis's shoes uh, as leader of, of, of the PCPO, uh, a great institution. What's not here is also working on the staff of a terrific prime minister, uh, uh, Brian Mulroney. Uh, and now, uh, I hope capping this career. I can't imagine that there are many more horizons left to conquer. But Is that uh, an age comment? I, I, I'm just thinking the city is going to need you for a long, long time. And we're not going to let you go now that we've got you where a lot of us have for a long time believed you belong. Uh, so, so those are a few career highlights. This is, um, we got rid of the embarrassing old photos in the checkered slacks from the 70s. Dee Dee Haywood made sure those didn't make this presentation. Um, but Toronto, there's Toronto in its checkered slacks. Uh, or, or sorry, that's the after picture. That's Toronto now. Um, that's our home, a uh, place to stand and a place that's going to keep growing, because it really is between three and four times the size of what it was uh, when this fellow uh, came, came into this world. So it's a story that's going to keep going. And a lot of how we do it is in the hands of the people in this room uh, working closely with the city government and, and with the uh, partnerships that this mayor is working so hard to put together. So one of the things I just want to flag at the, at the back end of this, we're going to want to circle back Mayor, and I, I want to just give you a heads up on that. One of the hallmarks of the ULI is that it is a business formation group as well as a, a summit group. There's a lot of people starting out in their careers. So your advice to young professionals 
uh, from, from the recent days when you were a young professional. Uh, I know we'll be, we'll be very enthusiastically regarded. We're going to have lots of time for Q&A, lots of time for dialogue. I want to start by asking you a few, uh, a few simple questions, uh, and then we'll get to the more complicated ones. Um, I never see you anymore. How are you enjoying being mayor <laughs> since you took office? It's great. I mean, it's a, you know what? I said, I gave a speech last night and I said to people, it's a privilege to have a job like this. And I mean that. I mean, the, the chance you get to sort of deal with different issues and meet people and see what's going on in the city, whether it's business, social, cultural, political, artistic, uh, you know, development, is, is a, it's a privilege. And uh, so I'm, I'm enjoying it very much. It's hard work. And I'm a bit frustrated by the process sometimes, as I know you are. But that, that's something that I'm going to work to fix uh, because I think we can do better at that. But it's good. It's all good. It's a great city. Good. Um, you're new on this job, uh, and you're actually new to City Council. I guess the last time Toronto had a mayor that was new to City Council, and I'm looking to Steve Pakin to tell me if I'm wrong, because he will, um, was, I believe, William Howland, uh, going back to about 1906. So it's been a while <laughs> since, uh, since, since we put uh, a rookie into the captaincy. Um, that's got to mean that there are some things that you didn't expect. Um, and maybe it's the process requirements or maybe it's something else, but I was wondering if you could share with us, as much as you're willing, um, what's been a surprise? Not much has been a surprise. I mean, I have been uh, not surprised but can comment to you on the professionalism, notwithstanding some of your frustrations, which I'm sure we'll discuss with the, uh, the public service. They're just uh, amazingly competent uh, people. Uh, I think uh, they uh, are looking for a greater sense of direction than perhaps they've had in recent times, and I'm happy with my council colleagues, including Gary Crawford, to offer that because I think that's what we're there to do. Um, so that hasn't been a surprise to me, but it's just been a pleasant uh, ob observation that how competent the public service is. Um, I guess I've commented before, and again, it isn't a surprise, but um, I am struck by the fact that there sometimes is a lack of urgency about things that I feel a great sense of urgency about. Maybe it's because I'm old, but I, you know, I, I, I feel a great sense of urgency about a lot of the things that are confronting the city, and I recognize that in a big government, you're not going to get things done overnight, but I think there are some things where we've allowed that lack of a sense of urgency to, you know, lull us into a place where a great city could be a lot greater if we just got at some of these things, and that's what I would like to do, and, um, but that's going to involve some change at the City Hall uh, on the part of my political colleagues, to be candid, and including myself. I mean, I'll just tell you a story. I mean, it, it was on the public record, but I stood up at the end of the last council meeting, and we'd had a good council meeting. The tone of it was... I think significantly improved over what we'd seen in previous times. Um, and I just said, however, that, that I thought that we could do a lot better because I found the, uh, the, the part of the process astonishing whereby people would come in in the middle of the council meeting and file endless notices of motion, the purpose of which, quite frankly, were just to sort of get something on the record or get a news story in the newspaper um, and ask for yet another study. And the very same people that are doing the studies, um, that are there really just to get that one day's publicity, are the same people that are asked to do the serious studies that relate to different aspects of what you're doing and what we're doing with respect to parks or culture or economic development or whatever. And I just don't think we can go on that way. I mean, it's sort of a misuse of everybody's time. And so I made that little talk, and I think I sat down, and everybody was sort of saying, where did that grumpy fellow come from? But um, I meant it in a very sincere way, and not a critical way of people. I'm just saying, I think we have to change that sort of thing in order to restore confidence in the process on the part of citizens and business people and others. Um, so, but, uh, you know, aside from that, I, as I said, it's a privilege to have this job, and I sort of knew what the rules were when I took it. Um, and uh, it's, 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 it's a great challenge. You've worked in <clears throat> very senior roles at the federal level and at the provincial level. Um, you just described two seconds ago, uh, this Toronto government is a big government. Um, a lot of people wouldn't see it that way compared to the feds or compared to the province. Tell me what's big about this government. Well, I think it's big in the scope of things that it deals with, and I, I actually think the scope of the federal and provincial governments taken separately is actually, you know, the, the, the city government's scope in terms of the things it deals with on a day-to-day -day basis for its people and for its businesses and for its you know, cultural world and so on is, is actually wider. Um, and it's much more granular because you're actually dealing, I mean, those governments, a lot of what they do, and I'm not diminishing the importance of it, is about making big policy decisions on foreign affairs or the economy or whatever and transferring money. Whereas the city government has responsibility um, you know, for delivering services. Uh, the water has to come on, the police have to come, the fire department have to come, the planning decisions have to be made, you know, and on it goes. And so I think in that sense it's a bigger government in that there are probably uh, moving parts that if you multiplied them all out would be more in number than you might get um, in the other governments. 
Um, and so I think, and, and I think that's a challenge too, because what you're dealing with, of course, is a big government with a lot of moving parts, with a government, uh, the political structure that actually has resting in one place kind of a, a quasi-executive structure um, with the legislative structure. I mean, there is no majority party, there is no power as a premier or a prime minister normally has to make decisions and say, like a CEO normally would, that's what we're going to do. Um, and, and so you have to sort of build coalitions and persuade people and, and so on, and that's fine. I mean, again, I knew what those rules were, but it's certainly a big difference to have a big government like that with a lot of moving parts with a kind of a quasi-executive responsibility. I often say in meetings that, you know, I'm described in the City of Toronto Act as the chief executive officer of the corporation, but, you know, compared to my actual experience as the chief executive officer of a business corporation, it's a dramatically different experience in terms of your... I mean, and, and you know, it's not just about the accountability you face where you walk out of your office and there's 25 people waiting out there to ask you why you did what you did and why didn't you do something else and, you know, why you should be ashamed of yourself or whatever. But um, it, it's about the fact that you just don't have the latitude to say, well, look, I've decided and this is the way we're going and I'm accountable for that. I'd love to have that accountability that could go with quicker decision making. But again, I'm not complaining about that. I'm just saying, I think you all know that's the way this works. The system is what it is. And so it's very different than being another kind of chief executive officer. Interesting. Well, it's obviously grown because <clears throat> we all remember when the Toronto government was a small thing um, and uh, mostly designed really to execute public policy set in the province. Um, but looking more broadly, um, you're a Toronto guy. You, you grew up in the city, you grew up with the city. Um, you work closely with a lot of the leaders who've guided the city's rise. Um, now it's your turn, and the starting point is so important. How would you characterize where you think we are in the life of the city? Where is Toronto at when you sit on your desk at the second floor of City Hall? Well, I think we've now matured into, and I, and I don't, you know, I, you can use various of these expressions and they all sort of seem sometimes tired, but I think we have matured into a global city in many respects. The first and foremost of them being we may be one of the only truly global cities in the context of who lives here and how we live here together. And I think that if there's one thing that I'm very anxious to make sure that we both preserve and do better at because there's substantial room for improvement, it is making sure that in the area in which we're seen as a model, which is all the people coming from all the places they've come and living here peacefully together and all having the same opportunity that we expect as Canadians, uh, that uh, we will be able to continue with that and avoid uh, some of the things we've seen in many, many other countries, including countries that are well-established democracies and liberal democracies like ours. Um, I think in terms of our um, physical form, as it were, we're, we've gone through a transformation from a day in which we thought, well, uh, you know, we have so much land here, we're such a big country, we can afford to just to sort of do anything we want to a day when we come to recognize for a variety of reasons, including environmental reasons, uh, you know, cost-related reasons and so on, that we have to have a, a denser kind of development uh, in the city of Toronto itself. And I think that's a good thing, properly done. And that relies on us and you to do that properly together. Um, I think in terms of its kind of artistic and social and cultural uh, evolution, the city is evolving again into a sort of a global city that, I mean, I, I marvel at the fact, I really do, at the fact that our city, which is not the biggest by any sense globally, um, is in a relatively small country um, and is a great city, but nonetheless we rank, and, and several of our Canadian cities rank in the top five or six or seven of any list that's ever published about cities in the world. And I think that says something about the care and the professionalism of our public service and the leaders we've had and decisions that have been made, but I think it also speaks to our values and says that the reason people rank these cities so high is not because of the weather, for sure. It's not because of the fact that we're the biggest. It's because they see that we've taken the care um, and, and the consideration as a result of the values we have as Canadians to do things, I'll, I'll say properly, that's the word I would use, and carefully and as a result have constructed something very special. And I think my job and your job and the job of all the other people in public life, whether they be public servants or politicians, is to keep that evolution moving forward positively and not screw it up. Not screw it up. And I mean not screw it up socially, not screw it up physically, and not screw it up economically. And there are lots of pitfalls in front of all of us where we could screw it up. And we just, I think we have to sort of avoid doing that and try to move it forward. So, so let me ask you this, that's, that's, that's interesting. Some say that Toronto is the result of patient and prudent, sensible, good work and leadership and participation. Others would say it's more a fortune's child. Uh, advantageous place, uh, reasonable climate, um, lucky in its choice of neighbors. It's obviously a bit of both. Maybe you can reflect a bit of what you see about either aspect of it a little bit more. It's, it's interesting to hear your view on. 
Well, I, I think it is. Look, good luck is good luck. I mean, what do they say? Sometimes it's better to be lucky than smart. But having said that, I mean, we have also done some things right. We've done some things wrong, and I don't want to focus on the negative, but I think if you looked at the degree, when you talk about the growth of the city, the degree to which we oversaw that growth, saw it happening, participated in it, benefited from it, uh, and yet we failed to take decisions, and I say we in the broadest collective sense, to put in place the kind of infrastructure, to sometimes put in place the kind of standards that would make sure that growth wasn't just growth for the sake of growth. Um, and so I think we have to sort of put up a couple of caution flags on that, and certainly one of the reasons I'm so committed to doing something substantial in the period that I'm given about public transportation is I think we had allowed a significant deficit to develop there. And as far as I'm concerned, that's bad for the quality of life in the city, it's bad for the economy of the city, it's bad for, uh, I think, uh, sensible uh, development. I mean, it's not really good for anybody. Maybe the auto industry, I suppose, and people who sell gasoline. But I mean, uh, and I'm not, I'm not anti-car at all, but I'm just saying I think they might be the only ones who'd say, well, we'll just leave it the way it is. But having said that, I think those are some things where we have been, you know, I don't know whether we're short-sighted or lacking in courage. And I think, uh, you know, as we talk a little bit about intensification, I mean, I think we're going to have to summon up some courage going forward. And I mean we as in politicians, but we as in people and citizens and people in the development industry to find new and better ways to do things uh, because we simply have to accept the fact people want to come and live here. This is a good thing. You know what a good thing it is. But uh, there's going to have to be different forms of development that are going to be accommodated within the city, accommodated by everybody, you, us, and the citizens, uh, in order to make sure there's places for them to live that keep the city with the kind of character we'd want it to have. So, uh, you know, I just think it's, 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 it's some good decisions that have been made. You went all the way back to mentioning this, but on expressway. There's still people around who violently disagree with that decision. But when you think that, that, that a man who I love, so I admit my bias, I mean, he's my political mentor and my friend, but a man said in 1971, all those years ago, cities are for people, not cars. Not meaning there shouldn't be cars, but simply you don't plan your city around cars. You plan it around people and different ways they get around and different ways they live. And, you know, that he was back then creating a Ministry of the Environment, it was a far-sighted decision. That was smart, in my view. Um, other stuff has been lucky. Fair enough. Um, <clears throat> you said the magic word. Let's go in a little closer to some of that intensification and transit and development uh, part of the conversation uh, with your signature transit proposal, which is Smart Track. Um, everyone here is going to be very familiar with it. Uh, more familiar than most, so I don't think we need to, to do too much of the, you know, sort of formalities. Let me ask you this. How's it coming? Are we going to get what you promised? Uh, is it going to be on time? Uh, when you promised it? How's yes, it yes, yes, and yes. Okay, good um, answer. Moving on. You heard it here first. Look, uh, it's a very it's complex. It's been three months of contact with reality. How's it complex. coming? <laughs> yeah, it's a very large, complex project. I'm very pleased by, by how it's coming along. What I'm most pleased at is the fact that you know you have perhaps, and I know it's happened before, it's not a first, but I think it's a first where it's sort of happening consistently. You have sitting at the same table, planning together, doing studies together, financing things together, and working together. Uh, the planning department from the city, the transportation department, Metrolinx, the TTC, uh, and various others, they're sitting there working on a project together. And that's the way all of these things should be done. It, as a result, I think it's going to happen better. Um, because they're working on it together and you're not going to have as much of these sort of competing studies and all that sort of thing that you're very familiar with. Um, I think it is something that is going to allow us, I mean, the basis upon which I picked it as something that I wanted to run on from the various transportation options I was given was very, very simple and I think common sense based. If you want to sort of have transit that is going to attract development, investment and jobs, connect people to jobs, uh, that is going to be done in the shortest possible period of time, allow that kind of connection to happen for the greatest number of people across the widest area and be done on the most cost-effective basis. When I was presented with a list of options, there was only one answer. It wasn't called Smart Track at the time. It was called, uh, pro was a project we had talked about as being building upon the regional express rail policy of the provincial government and saying that, okay, it's fine that you're going to electrify all the go train lines, but we had to have at least one, and we were only concerned with one, that would uh, all offer subway-like service, all-day, two-way, frequent electric train service uh, that would su service a broad swath of the 416 and, I think importantly for the first time, and it was mentioned by Morrow in his very kind introduction and by Richard, uh, connect, start to connect the region. Because, you know, this thing, not by accident at all, begins and ends in the 905. 
and will connect people to jobs both ways. There's this common assumption now building up that, well, of course, it'll allow people to go from Union Station who live in condos by the Rogers Center out to work at 905. I hope there's an awful lot of people who want to come to work the other way on Smart Track. But the bottom line is they can go both ways and in between. And so when the options were put in front of me in terms of what could be done with a particular emphasis on speed, because I felt so strongly about the deficit that had built up on public transportation, um, picking what turned out to be called Smart Track was an easy choice because it's cost effective per kilometer. It's a concept that's not being done for the first time here. It's been done, it's being done in Britain and Washington. It is a concept that uh, makes greater use of existing assets. It is a concept that's going to affect and, and be a benefit to a broad swath of people, millions of people across the entire GTA. It is regional. It does connect people to jobs. Um, so to me, it was an easy choice, literally. I mean, you know, in the meeting where the options were in front of me, I quickly said, that's the one that meets the test that I'd set out. And that was the test I set out, which to me is just a business-like test you would set out as to how can you best invest your money and get the best return as quickly as possible. The, um, there are lots of barriers to, I remember at the time that we talked about, you know, I said, okay, you understand that this is not, this is not something that's just going to happen overnight. It's come from outside. I don't remember you chain. saying that, but never mind. <clears throat> I deny everything, too. Within that, uh, we are among friends. Um, <coughs> what do you see as the biggest barriers to getting it done swiftly, as expressed on time, on budget? What, what's what's uh, preoccupying you on that front? I would say it's, it's a lack of, uh, of, of will on the part of any one of numbers of people. I mean, it, it isn't just about politics and government. I mean, sure, the government agencies have to decide together they're going to do something, do a, a smart track. And it won't be exactly, you know, and I know this will lead to some great story in the newspaper saying he said it won't be exactly as he said it was. Well, Harris I deliberately it. indicated during the election, and I was pilloried for it from time to time in those endless debates, that I couldn't answer every single question about it because how could you possibly? That's why we're doing the studies now. And so, but, but some uh, a project that is close in nature to what I talked about, uh, yes, it needs the will of politicians, but it needs the will and participation of the development industry, for example. Hmm. This thing is going to work. It is working for the benefit of people who want the city to grow and to develop, but it also requires um, you know, those people to grow and develop the city in order to make it work uh, over time. I mean, you can see the effects of projects we've undertaken in the past where development didn't follow the transit or wasn't allowed to through a lack of will and various other explanations. And it means that what you have is transit that doesn't work. I mean, it works in the sense the trains run every day, but it doesn't work financially in the long-term best interests of, uh, of the, and producing a kind of a, at least some kind of return measured in different ways on the investment we made. So I think it's going to require, I think the only thing, the thing that could best cause it to come apart or most likely cause it to come apart is simply that fracturing where we all decide we're not going to get behind this. And this is a bit our way. You'll have to admit, a bit our way as Torontonians and as Canadians, we, we, you know, we start to sort of argue about these things and decide that instead of saying, no, let's get back focused on all for one and one for all on getting some things done, we argue and we restudy and we reopen and we re-debate and people second guess. And I understand it's a democracy and you know, that, that, that goes with the territory and it's a free country. But at the same time, we've got to make some decisions, I think, on this and many other areas that this is the direction we're going, make the decision, stay the course and get it done because that's what happens in every other area of life, including families, small businesses, big businesses, charities. They don't have the latitude that government seems to think it has to sort of change your mind, have somebody come with a new report, and decide you're going to change direction, reopen debates, review decisions all the time. Um, we've got to make some decisions we stick to, and this is one that I certainly intend to try and show some leadership to make sure we stick to and get it done in the seven years so that people will be riding on those trains and getting to their jobs, and it'll relieve a lot of the problems we have with public transportation. So this starts to touch on some land use issues um, pretty clearly. I mean, you, you pretty directly, you, you, you spoke to us earlier about Toronto's, you know, had some recent experiences with, uh, with development without infrastructure. And you just now referred to some of our sad histories of some infrastructure that never got any development. So we've sort of looked at life from, from both, both nasty versions uh, of what can go wrong here. Matching up intensification and transit investment, um, as I understand it from, from the work that we did on, on the campaign and from the thinking that was out there from people like, not only Dawson, but Glenn Miller's here from CUI, and there's the Honorable Glenn Murray, who's one of the unsung uh, people on this. How, what are we gonna have to do to make that come together? Because that's new, that, that sort of Madrid-Hong Kong doctrine uh, that some call 
rail and property, uh, and now London doctrine, uh, is a little bit new to Toronto. What, what bridges do we have to cross to get to I think that? we're going to have to start looking at things with a greater sense of balance uh, and, and sort of, uh, I think we, uh, politics generally, and when I say politics, I mean that in the broadest sense with a small p, the sort of process of the inter interface between people in public life, but also governments and business and so on, had become, I, has become, I think, a very polarized sort of world when it can't. It can't, especially in a, government, a country like this that has a lot of government, for good or for bad, and where maybe that's why we've done careful planning and so on. But I think we've got to start to recognize the fact that on the one side, um, we are not going to be able to accommodate the people here, we're not going to be able to justify the investment we're making in public transit and so on if we don't accept as a, as a community that there must be development and that there has to be certain different kinds of development. And so that means some of the work that I know Jennifer's working so hard on to try and establish that there's going to need to be mid-rise development in certain parts of the city where right now it's resisted by the community and by politicians. And I think we're going to have to summon up the courage to say, look, we're going to have to do this, but we're going to have to find the ways to do it that is compatible with the neighborhoods, which can be done, that is cost effective for people in business like you are, um, and, and so on. But we have that challenge, so that's going to require courage and imagination on the part of lots of different people. Then flip it around and say, the other thing we're going to have to do, and this is going to rest more on you, understanding the fact that we in public life are going to have to say to you, you can't have development without infrastructure. We went by for a number of years, I think, um, you know, where we were satisfied to say, we'll deal with that later. I remember I spoke often during the campaign about the headline, you'll remember, that appeared at the last council meeting in August of the old council. And the headline said, 750 stories of development approved in one meeting. And I sort of said in the debates, I wasn't sure whether to treat this as good news or bad. I mean, good news it was in the sense a lot of jobs and a lot of activity for your companies and a lot of new places for people to live and work and all the rest. But at the same time, I said to myself, have we asked all the questions and got answers? What about parks? What about schools? What about recreation libraries? What about roads? What about transit? And on it goes. And I think if we're being honest with one another, not only were those questions perhaps not asked as thoroughly as they might have been, but we certainly didn't get the answers right then and there. And say, look, we're not going to postpone this discussion about transit for 10 years when the building's up and occupied for 10 years. We're going to talk about it now. And so I think we're going to have to have courage on all sides to say, look, we've got to look at the city as a great sort of organic uh, place uh, and that we have to make those decisions in that way together about the city. And, you know, you have to put up with the questions we're going to ask and insist on answers to with respect to that infrastructure. Right. And we are going to have to show more courage with the citizens about saying that if we're going to live in the city and want to live in the city, then there's going to be some intensification required. Last I checked, they're not making any new land in Toronto. So we're going to have to find new and creative ways that are compatible with the neighborhoods and so on that make the city great. So it's a, to me, it's, it is establishing that balance. But you can't have one without the other, either one. Well, that's, <clears throat> I mean, I live at Young and Summerhill, where we have a private subway station with one entrance, not accessible, lowest ridership, I think, of any other than Chester. Um, and, uh, and, um, Are you proud of that? No, <laughs> I'm spoiled rotten. I didn't say I was proud. Uh, <coughs> and every time intensification comes around us, uh, we get properly midtown, and we pull out our well-thumbed copies of old manifestos from John Sewell, my boyhood idol, and that sort of thing. But I guess uh, change is going to have to come to some of that, I suppose. How, do you, how are we going to achieve that balance, though? Because we don't want to upset the greatest legacy of, of Mayor David Crombie, which was keeping our neighborhoods from becoming what they shouldn't. Well, I mean, I just think it, it's going to require courage and imagination. But, I mean, we have both. Uh, we have one in plentiful supply here in your industry and in government and elsewhere in the planning community. We have some, some of the most clever people in the world mm -hmm. here who can help us with those kinds of ideas. And I think that uh, I've seen in this city, and I've certainly seen in Europe and other places, very attractive mid-rise development that does not uh, obliterate or otherwise uh, damage the character of the neighborhoods that are adjacent to it. So and let, let's let the planners of Twitter. What is your favorite urban uh, form in Europe for this kind of mid-rise? Well, I mean, I love the streets. And it, look, it's a, it's, diff it's a different history, and, and, and this go that it goes back. But think of all the streets you've walked down, those who have been to Europe, where there, it is routinely six or seven or eight or nine stories, and it's a story of retail at grade, and then seven or eight or nine stories of flat. They'd call them flats where people live and families live, and it's an accepted part of the way families would live in big cities like that that are very expensive as things are becoming here. And I think those streets are very comfortable to, to walk along. They are oftentimes adjacent to neighborhoods that are more like what we'd have here. But I just, I just think, and I think there are developments that have taken place in Toronto, including in some of the places where these developments are very controversial, that if you look at them are very attractive and very compatible, and once they're there, 
and established, people don't go by and curse them every day. You know, they actually come to accept them as being something that is part of the look and feel of a big global city, and it has not destroyed their neighborhood. Right. Those neighborhoods are well preserved. And even some buildings that are taller, and I'm not advocating, I think if we could get people to accept some mid-rise development, I, I find it astonishing to stand at Broadview and Danforth, and you could look down the street on a clear or even a misty day, and, and, and there's no problem looking down the street. And I'm not saying we should be looking at a wall of buildings all the way along, but we, we've done nothing along, and we've made that huge investment in public transportation in 1965. Mm -hmm. And I think somewhere between the status quo and doing something that is threatening to people, this not, need not be seen as a threat to neighborhoods. Um, but, you know, you, you have to exercise the discipline as well of saying that you're going to work with us to find a way to have that kind of development as opposed to saying let's have, you know, only 45-story towers and so on because, frankly, I will be uh, one who will be saying, well, no, that's not going to be suitable in every place because it isn't. You know that. Uh, and I know you can make more money sometimes building those, and I'm all in favor of people making money except that there's also city building that has to go on. And so, again, it's that balance between saying there's a time and a place for everything. And there's lots of places for tall buildings, um, but there's also places for other kinds of development. And I think we haven't had the courage collectively as a community, and sometimes perhaps you haven't shown the imagination to say, well, let's find ways to do that that is compatible and that lends itself to being next door to those neighborhoods and next door to the transit. That's, that's why you're putting it there, right. or major arteries. Um, so Ford Nation, take note. Tory admits he's been why to are Europe. We that? You've been to Europe, and you liked it, OK? <laughs> I'm so glad the campaign is over and, and I will, <laughs> sensible discussions can happen. And just to put it on the record right it. now, because people <laughs> are fascinated to write about this stuff, I'll be going back to Europe as appropriately. I'm not a big traveler that travels for the sake of doing it, but I'm going to get out on the road and sell the city because the investment isn't going to come here by itself. Um, and the mayor isn't the only person that can sell it, and I'm not going to go by myself. But at the end of the day, the mayor is the head of the city government and is, I think, part of your responsibility is to sell the city as a place to invest. I think it's also useful to go and see things you know, for yourself that allow you to see how things are done in other cities because you'll come back better informed about that sort of thing. But I intend to go out and sell the city because I think there's lots to sell and it doesn't sell all by itself. It does, but I think you've got to work even harder. There's lots of competition out there for investment right now and I think we have to get more than our share because we deserve it. Well, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So like Douglas MacArthur, you shall return even if it's to Europe. Okay, he vowed. Um, we're getting some, we got some interesting questions through the high technology miracle of Twitter. They gave me some, some paper with some questions that came in from Twitter because <laughs> lots of, which is about my speed as my daughters explain to me frequently. Um, but no, there's been a wonderful public engagement that ULI has done with its membership and with the general population. Uh, and we did want to get, make sure that some of those voices had a chance to be heard. I mean, one of the, one of the interesting questions that came in uh, was from a, a, a Kendra Fitz Randolph, whose mom, if I remember properly, was a downtown activist uh, of a previous generation, but I may be wrong on that, who wanted to ask uh, Mayor Ed John Tory T.O., um, what, what do you think about funding for creative business and arts improvement, particularly on West Queen West, but maybe more broadly on our signature streets uh, and avenues, and is it a competitive lever that you want to go and sell us in Europe with? Funding for the art, for, for arts, did you Arts, say? creative businesses, and oh. arts improvement, just stimulating that whole yeah, ecosystem. Look, I mean, I'm one of those people who says that, you know, we can't just be sort of saying we're going to hand out money to everybody because right now, I mean, the city's finances are in a state that I'm not one of those who's pushing panic buttons as people were doing last week and saying we have to have, you know, sort of catastrophic tax increases to survive. I don't believe that's true. I think that we need, we need greater support from the other governments. I will say this, I mean, because I seek every opportunity to say this that I can't. <laughs> Um, I don't say this to try and inflame, uh, my, my, I view my job as actually to sort of strengthen partnerships and form new partnerships because I don't think anybody can do anything alone. Uh, I do think that we have to get over in both this country and in this province the notion that somehow it's politically incorrect to do things for Toronto. Toronto is at the heart of this country. Toronto is the economic engine of this country. Toronto is the fastest growing city in this country. Toronto is the best known city in this country. Toronto is a magnet for immigrants and investment in this country. And thing, everything that is done for Toronto is going to strengthen Canada and Ontario. And so it, not, it should not be viewed as something to apologize for, but something to be proud of, and that's going to build up Ontario and Canada. And so in that context, um, I think that, um, you know, I'm going to be sort of trying to make sure that we get 
um, a, uh, uh, get additional investments that we require in things like public transportation from those other governments who have access to the sources of revenue that grow with the economy. When you hear the good news about our economy, I guess growing at now close to what, 3% next year, which is fabulous relative to the rest of the world, that actually won't benefit the city's finances very much because we rely on property and commercial taxation that don't uh, grow with the economy necessarily. I mean, they, they don't. Um, and so, I think that while I want to sort of solve our problems that way and try to do it, and I've committed to myself to doing it at or below the rate of inflation when it comes to property uh, taxes, and that will have a beneficial effect on commercial taxes, which as you know, we're uh, rebalancing. I still think that we have to use the tax system locally to make sure that we have a thriving creative sector here. And I committed myself to that during the campaign too, because that is part of what's attracting investment. It's not by accident we've become one of the startup capitals of North America. I think we're seen as second or third in all of North America. And we have here something quite unique. In, in the United States, the financial capital is in New York and the sort of innovative capital is in California. Um, but they're, they're separated. Um, we have uh, here the financial capital and the capital of innovation in the country in the same place, which is Toronto. And that is going to require to keep that going. The great educational uh, critical mass we have here, especially in the areas of technology and areas like that. Um, and it's going to require you know, things like sound public transportation to connect people to jobs. But it's also going to require a thriving creative class uh, because that attracts people who are um, innovators and risk takers and startup people. And we need those people to come here. We need them badly to come. And that's partly what you're out selling. When I go with a delegation, I'd like to take not just business people with me to go somewhere. I'd like to take some people from the arts to say, hey, you know, you want to come to this city because it's a fabulous place to live in terms of the quality of life, speaking about the arts, not just about the business community, which is great. Terrific. Um, here's an authentic, uh, uh, pungent voice from the street. Toronto is from, from Twitter. Why don't we skip that one? Because, <laughs> because it's urgent, Mayor. No, seriously, Toronto is looking filthy these days. Uh, so much garbage everywhere. What's being done to clean up the city? I haven't embarked on something, but you know, it's funny because I would have a different observation. I think there are sort of flashpoints where it's dirty, and I think those tend to be, let's be honest about it, I think they tend to be in places where there are a lot of kind of fast food outlets and inadequate uh, numbers of those receptacles that are there. Mm -hmm. And, and I, mean, I think the worst and most disgraceful sight to me in our city is one of those receptacles that is overflowing with garbage. And, and it happens more in the summer than the winter because I guess people are outside and so on more in the summer. And so I've noticed that as a private citizen, and you've just sort of drawn it to my attention because I've been sort of focused since I got there, which is what, 100 days ago on traffic and, and getting Smart Track going uh, on the budget, of course, under the leadership of uh, Councillor Crawford. But I think, you know, this summer we're going to have to do something about that. And I mean, to me, I look at that as somebody who's run a big, complicated company before and say if overflowing trash bins um, is the biggest problem you got, then, you know, it's pretty small potatoes. It's a pretty simple prospect to fix that. I mean, you just clean them out more often or get bigger ones. I mean, you know, <laughs> it's not rocket science. And so I, I'm glad, you know, and, and I think if you, <laughs> but I don't mean to sound too cynical because I'm not, but I mean, this is where, you know, if I came in tomorrow morning and sort of said, well, we should either get bigger ones or clean them up more often, I might be told there'd be a lengthy study that would have to go on and I'd say, <laughs> well, I, no, I, I, I don't think so. But, but you know what, you've drawn it to my attention and I think it's correct in some place, but I think actually anybody who says the city is pungent or whatever, they're being, they're exaggerating. I think the city is still fairly clean, but we have to make it very clean and we have to make sure it stays that way because I think, and I still have people come to me who are visiting here who tell me how clean the city is, but we just can't let down our guard on that, that's all. Well, I think you'll have to RFP that lengthy study um, or you're gonna be in a lot of trouble, but um, our good friend, ULI's good friends at Buzz Buzz Home, uh, actually ask you something that's on Twitter that speaks to your powerful emotive response about garbage. Um, do you prefer house living or condo living? I think I can guess. You know, it depends at the stage in your life you're at. I mean, I think if you're lucky enough to be able to live in a single family home when you have children, I mean, it's great for them to have a yard to play in and so forth. And so we were fortunate enough, uh, my wife and I, we had four kids. We started off living in an apartment uh, and then we bought a house and moved from house to house. And then when our kids left, we moved to a condo. Now at that stage in our lives where, um, you know, the kids are gone and living in their own homes, 
Um, I think condo living is wonderful. I mean, it's downtown. It's uh, convenient to sort of close the door and not have to worry about many things. So if you said to me, I, I would say I've enjoyed both parts of that part of my that aspect of my life. Um, and uh, I even proved to myself that I really don't care where I live much because I don't. And my wife, Barb, would confirm this to you. During the time when our condo wasn't quite ready, but we'd sold our house, um, I lived above her office in a 500 square foot uh, apartment that wasn't even, I mean, didn't even have the conveniences of a brand new condo building because it was kind of in one of those old second floors of a retail uh, building. And she was conveniently out of town most of the time for some strange reason that we were living there. <laughs> and uh, I was very comfortable. And I said to her when she came back, you know, I could get used to living here. It's fine. I mean, it's, uh, it's got everything you need. It had a small place to watch TV. It had a bed. It had a bathroom. It had a little place to cook and eat. And I thought it was great. So the the I hungry years on the Suvlaki joint on the Danforth, you missed you miss it. So, but anyway, I, I, cause both, both forms of living are good. And you know what? Again, I mean, we're going to have to adjust, we meaning you and us, to the fact that condo living is going to be an established part of life. I was delighted, by the way, uh, to see that the development unveiled at Bathurst and Bloor last night contained a really strong commitment by, uh, by a, a respected developer to rental accommodation. Yeah. Uh, I thought that was wonderful. But having said all that, there will be rental. I hope even more of it. And we can talk about affordable housing if anybody wants to, because I sure would like to. But would there's going to be there's going to be condos too. And I think all we have to take account of is there are going to be more and more families who will choose. It's not just a matter of being forced to by price. And so they'll choose, as they do in many other great cities, to live in multi-unit residential accommodation downtown, because that's where they want to live. And we'll have to make sure that we have both buildings and surrounding amenities that take account of the fact that that's how they're going to live, but their amenities won't be in the form of a single family home with a backyard, but that's why they'll need a park, and they'll need a library, and they'll need this, and they'll need that. And uh, I think that's an exciting prospect, actually. Um, let's talk for a minute. Uh, that's not going to happen. Talk as long as you want about affordable housing. Well, I'll just because say I know this. how important it is to you. I, I, I only want to say it's important to me, and I haven't really had a chance to talk about the sort of social side of me. And I did last night in the speech I gave to a very business-oriented audience of about 400 people. And I, I said, first of all, people like me have to do a better job explaining to average citizens the difference between public or social housing and affordable housing. Because I think a lot of people blend the two issues together in their head and think when politicians or others are talking about the need for affordable housing, they're talking about public housing. We need that, and we need that to be properly repaired. And frankly, the state of our public housing is a disgrace uh, morally, and it's, an, it's, it's, it's a disgrace business-wise because they're public assets and we're letting them fall down. Next year, if we don't continue to act as the city government's trying to do, uh, we're going it alone at the moment, um, there will have to be closed uh, due to uh, uninhabitability 4,000 public housing units in this city. I mean, who would ever let that happen to an asset that they own? Would you let that happen to your house? Would anybody? But that's what's going to happen. Now, we're investing to sort of stop that, but we're doing it alone at the moment. The other governments are not participating in repairing the stock of, of social housing. But let's go over to the other side, which is affordable housing. And I was just trying to explain last night, no, I mean, to people that what we're talking about here is a supply of housing for people uh, who uh, we need to be working in the city uh, in jobs that are not going to ever allow them to be able to afford uh, you know, unaffordable rental accommodation, in other words, market rental accommodation, because it's become a very expensive city. And I recognize the first thing I did it, it, to start to study the issue was to invite a bunch of people from the rental construction industry into my office. And I said, all right, what is it going to take in terms of all the suite of tools that we have at our disposal to attract you back into that business of affordable rental housing? Because I recognize you and those people are in business. Um, by the way, the first thing they mentioned, uh, and it's something that I'm going to take to heart after the budget is completed, is to see about how long it takes to get anything approved to get done in the city. Um, and they said, if you could sort of have a faster process to allow us to move from you know, land uh, purchase to actually having these buildings occupied, that would help a lot. And I understand that. So I'm just, I'm very committed uh, to making sure we do better. We set a target of 1,000 affordable housing units a year back in about 2009, I think. And I think we're thousands behind already on that. And we've got to fix that. Because you can't have a city that is socially healthy um, that is economically healthy, given the jobs that do exist for people who are going to make a lesser income. And you, those people are not going to be commuting in from Peterborough or Ajax. They don't have a car, and they, 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 they have to have affordable accommodation in the city. And you have to build it, and we have to make sure we help to make that possible. One of the um, <clears throat> best tools for enabling, historically, that building process and handling some of those balances that you described is uh, Section 37 benefits. Um, but they're a subject of lively discussion. 
certainly among experts like this. Uh, you have indicated a desire to review Section 37 benefits. Can you maybe share with the group a little bit more about what your thinking is? What, are, what would you like to see the focus on? Where do you have a sense it might stand improvement? Where are you coming from on, on Section Well, I can utterly keep myself out of trouble by saying it's not my responsibility. It's the province's legislation, and they'll deal with it as they see fit. <laughs> but I won't do that. Um, that wouldn't be like you. I will only say this. Um, I'm fascinated by the fact that if you look at all the court decisions about Section 37, when people have got into court disputes with one another about it, the wording that the courts come back with is that, that it has to be sort of a clear, transparent connection between what's being asked for and, and what's being built. And so I mean, I'm oversimplifying the court cases a bit, but not too much. I find this the murkiest kind of process that I've ever seen, and I say that as somebody who's relatively new to civic politics as an elected official. And I think what we need to have with it more so than anything else is clarity and transparency um, and, and consistency, because I think it's fair to all concerned. I mean, the government as well as the, uh, as well as the, um, the people who are in the development business on the other side of that table, or those tables. Um, I think we have to sort of look now, I mean, myself, I would like to see those involved, uh, assuming you left the system as it was in terms of uh, the concentration of that money being where the concentration of development is, and at the moment that would be a legal requirement. I'd like to see some of those, all those people agree to allocate a significant percentage of that to affordable housing. I can't talk out of both sides of my mouth, and the money's not going to come from you know, falling out of the sky. Uh, for that, but having said all that, um, I just think there's a need for us to sort of revisit that to make sure what we're doing is equitable, sensible, and as clear and transparent as the court cases seem to say, but I'm not sure I find it an incredibly clear or transparent process. Don't know if you do, but uh, I just, as one newcomer to City Hall, I don't. And I think we have to take a hard look at it and do it without, uh, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, do it in a selfless kind of way so that those who would be the major beneficiaries of the system at present are prepared to look at what is in the broader public interest. That is what we're all there to do. It's one of the problems with our current city government is you elect people ward by ward. I'm the only person elected across the city. And I very deeply feel my responsibility to be responsible to all parts of the city and to bring them all together. I happen to believe every other councillor, while they have special responsibilities for their ward, are also elected to make decisions because they participate in every single decision that's made about every part of the city far away from their own wards. And so I think it's necessary to a greater extent that we all take into account the global health of the city. Um, and that includes looking at these issues without, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, you know, without order. coveting, I mean, oh, things yeah. that you may have yourself. And I'm not necessarily directing that at six or seven people, but maybe I am. I don't I'll think be in, in trouble now. You see, I told you I'd get in some trouble, but your, that's your, okay. Your campaign it's only code Wednesday. of conduct was, called, was dubbed the Ten Commandments. I don't think covetousness was in there, but yeah. maybe, maybe we have to go back and revisit that. But we've um, got to think, John, more about yeah. all for one and one for all. Yeah, that's right. You know, what's happening in Scarborough, it, it, what's good for Scarborough is good for the rest of Toronto, and what's bad for Scarborough is bad for the rest of Toronto. We have to start thinking that way, and we haven't been doing enough of that, and that applies to everybody, business people, politicians, I won't blame public servants for that, but I just think we've got to get over that. It's one city, it's a great city, and it's going to be built up because the whole city is built up, including where jobs are located. I'm absolutely determined I mean, to see us do whatever we can to help convince and attract businesses to invest in Scarborough. And I've talked about that, that it's going to help make the new subway work and Smart Track. Mm -hmm. And the same with Downsview and the same with Northwest Toronto. Those are places that haven't had the level of investment, and I understand you know, that's the free market at work, but I think there are things we can do to convince people to go and locate jobs there. It's going to be healthy for the city, healthy for those neighborhoods, good for the transit, um, and so on. So and I just think that we have to start thinking that what's going to happen in Northwest Toronto is as good for the guy in Southeast Scarborough, for Gary Crawford, as it is for the people who are up in Northwest Toronto. Fair enough. Um, Food for thought, you've set the table for a banquet, and there are lots of hungry people who I know want to engage. Um, so maybe if we can start to, to move to questions from this group. Um, we have an able and dedicated staff of uh, TRBOT and ULI volunteers who are patrolling the area with microphones. Um, so if any of you uh, have a question, there's, there's one there, and I think there's, there's another one uh, on the other side. Uh, but if any of you have a question, just please raise your hand. She'll come on over. Uh, just please rise, state your name and your affiliation, uh, and um, let fly with a question for the mayor. There's so a hand uh, up there. There is a hand. Okay, okay. You always worry about the first guy that's got a question. Absolutely. Please state your name and affiliation and let fly. Uh, hi, my name is Kyle Pinto from Energy at Work. 
And uh, just coming from a sustainability background, I wanted to see uh, how you think, and I know that you have experience with Race to Reduce, uh, being the chair there, how you think uh, sustainability uh, fits in with the, the, the future of the city with resilience, uh, looking at energy management. Uh, crucially important, and you know, for example, I think we've got to get back at with uh, with again your cooperation and people that are you know in, in uh, related uh, industries to, to those in this room, uh, the tower renewal program, for example. Um, you know, the race to reduce. Some of you may not know what it is, but it was an initiative that was undertaken uh, under the uh, umbrella of Civic Action, which I was the chair of. And it, uh, you know, when we first uh, thought of it, it was actually one of many of David Pico's ideas, but I sort of picked it up when he got sick and subsequently when we lost him. And it was at the time deemed impossible by everybody concerned that the landlords of the city, the commercial landlords, would get together and decide that they would even sit at the same table as one another and decide on having a sort of a friendly competition to reduce energy issues by 10%. Um, and lo and behold, they sort of started to come to the meetings and then there were endless discussions that went on for about a year on how you'd measure you know, the 10% because everybody had a different idea and thought they were all going to get shafted by one another on the, under the rules. And then they finally agreed and it, we got underway with it. And I was proud that when I left Civic Action after about, uh, I guess probably four or five years of this friendly competition, we actually had measurable decreases in energy usage of 9.8%. We were almost at the 10, or I think it was 9.5. It was very close to 10. And people were sitting regularly with one another and talking about how can we reduce paper usage together and things like that. Uh, I, I would then say to myself, well, there's a whole bunch of people that aren't involved in that, other smaller landlords, residential landlords, and so on, but that comes back to something like the Tower Renewal Program, which says with our huge stock of particularly rental housing built in the 60s and 70s, and it was built in a particular way with a particular, uh, you know, bonus of land, uh, at least bonus of uh, density given for the land that's around it, so there's opportunities there, and why don't we have more discussions than we're having, um, you know, right now about people who want to take the initiative to not just energy retrofit those buildings, but re renew those neighborhoods, those neighborhoods, those high-rise buildings are neighborhoods, and oftentimes they're in clusters. Um, and there may be some things that you could benefit from in that regard by using some of that land in a different way that's there from a previous time. And so I just think that, that sustainability in that sense, the resilience, I mean, today I'm down having a press conference with the CEO of Hydro and the CEO of the Toronto Water, the manager of Toronto Water, talking about the last few days' events with, with pipes and, and, and hydro. And one of the reporters says, um, you know, uh, so, so, it's one of those questions that sort of implied we weren't really sort of ready to deal with these things. And I said, well, you know, it, it's not so much that we've made plans, it's that things are changing and we're not keeping up with the change in the weather. And we could get onto a long discussion about that, which we won't do here, but, but the bottom line is things are changing in terms of the weather and, and therefore we've got to keep up with that in the context of what we do vis-a-vis -vis sustainability, but also resiliency. So there's a lot of work to be done in all these areas, but it, all of these things are going to require partnerships again. You know, the government can't go around and decide we're going to sort of, we don't actually build a lot of buildings. We shouldn't be building hardly any. You should be doing that, and that's what you're good at, but we should be making sure that they meet a certain standard, and, 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 and I think we're doing not a bad job of that, but we've got to do much more of it, including retrofitting a lot of the old buildings and well, doing things like race to reduce carried through to residential buildings or to, to public buildings. Even the public buildings are not really keeping up. Yeah. With, with a lot of those buildings, as I understand it, uh, and I was, I was hearing from um, Gregor Robertson, who was in for your well-hosted and very successful Big City Mayor's Conference, um, with a lot of them, the energy wastage is the key to creating a potential revenue stream that can actually provide the funding to, to pay for the capital improvements that are needed. Um, in a world where the city is somewhat capital starved and the other two governments are not as forthcoming as you want, is there a role, uh, does, does the housing task force you've got, for example, have some room for thinking about roles for private capital in, in making that equation come together? Yes. Now, I'm not presuming what their report's going to say, but I can tell you that it was set out in their terms of reference, and I made it clear to Senator Eggleton, who kindly agreed to take on the chairmanship of that, that I wanted them not to be constrained in how they thought about how we could address governance and financing and other questions that are related in particular to the Toronto Community Housing portfolio, but that's a large number of buildings in the city. Uh, and I, I said to him, I fully expect with him and people like Ed Clark and others involved, I will end up with a report that goes well beyond advising me with respect to Toronto Community Housing and gives me a lot of other ideas on housing generally and how we can do exactly what you say. Which is, see, I'm not afraid 
I mean, subject to, uh, the, the, to the usual role, whether it's an oversight or regulatory role by government, I'm not afraid of the ingenuity and the capital of the private sector. I think we desperately need it to make the city work well. I think it is like beyond my comprehension that the major pools of capital that exist in this province, the Teachers Pension Fund and Omers, and you could name as many of them as I can, are investing in projects all over the world and very few at home. It's beyond belief to me that that's going on, but that's going on because we haven't, we've sort of shied away uh, from saying these are people we should welcome, subject to appropriate oversight and the appropriate role for government that we see uh, as being appropriate depending on what we're talking about. We should welcome them and welcome their ideas and welcome their ingenuity that have attracted them to people all over the world to do, build and finance and operate or whatever it is the deal says, different projects. Because otherwise we have the alternative, which is what we've had for 25 years, we just don't get stuff done. I'll take a question here. Um, in my introduction, I said you were, and I believe this, the first post-amalgamation mayor who really gets what region means. And I'm wondering, and you've had great experience before you were mayor as leader of civic action, as, as chair of the uh, Greater Toronto Marketing Alliance. Here we are in the, in the um, Toronto Region Board of Trade. ULI Toronto's tagline is advancing the Toronto region. Region is really, really important. Now that you are mayor, what does that mean for your mandate? It means that I uh, am not going to confine my own efforts to, 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 on economic development or on transit or on advocacy to the other governments to sort of uh, my own show by myself. Um, I, I, economic development in particular, we're probably the furthest advanced on because I continue to be the co-chair of the Greater Toronto Marketing Alliance with Mayor Dave Ryan from Pickering. And maybe the fact that he and I are the two co-chairs of that makes a statement in and of itself. You have a mayor from 905 and the mayor of 416 together as co-chairs of an organization that is meant to advance the economic development of the entire region. And so that means that one of the people that it, when I do go on one of those trips that I talked about earlier to sell Toronto, I'm actually going to be going to sell the Toronto region. And I'm quite happy if uh, Bonnie Crombie wanted to come with me, the mayor of Mississauga, and if we took somebody from Sheridan College, which is located more in Brampton and Mississauga than it is in Toronto, because that was going to be the best foot we were putting forward for this region. And I think that kind of cooperation is crucial. Gone should be the days when people from Mississauga, Brampton, Richmond Hill, and Toronto all show up at the same trade meeting in Frankfurt and run into each other in the halls and tour by each other's competing booths. We're in this together. People are going to invest in the Toronto region. It's city regions that compete with one another. And when I had the privilege of overseeing a study that was done in that regard, you saw that those that do it best, which by the way include Montreal, London, Miami, and so on, they did it as a region. They did it cooperatively. And we're going to have to then go from there to public transportation. Same thing. Gone should be the days, gone can be the days where we can afford to make decisions and say, well, my only job is to worry about 416 and we're just going to have transportation you know, for 416. It's, it doesn't accord with the reality of how people live and work. And so I intend to be active in the region, that I intend to be showing leadership uh, with Civic Action and the Board of Trade and others at bringing people together to talk about these things and I hope make decisions together. And, and I think the provincial government is thinking the same way. They want us to be together as a region to talk about things together and I hope their policies um, take account of that while at the same time recognizing that the city of Toronto, just to repeat myself because it's important I want to repeat because I believe it so passionately, is I mean, you know, when people ask me, well, who should we compare Toronto to or how should it be treated? I said it should be treated the same as all other cities of three million people in the region or in the province or the country. <laughs> it's the only one. And it has, it, but it, that, that's just a fact. We have challenges here that are unlike those of any other city in the country. And I'm not saying we're more important or we're better, I'm just saying we're different. And we should be treated as the only city of almost three million people with the challenges we have. Uh, in this entire country and in this entire province. And we should get over the fact that people might take offense at that somewhere else. I mean, it, it's going to be good for them in the end if this city is strong and healthy. Great. Uh, thanks. Hi. Uh, I'm Richard Witt from Quadrangle Architects. I'm also on the uh, ULI board. Uh, I would like to thank you very much, first of all, for coming. Uh, I was very pre pleased that you accepted the, uh, the opportunity. And I also want to express to you what uh, I felt, and I think many in this um, room felt, which was when you were elected a, a massive collective sigh of relief. So, uh, thank you very much. Um, my, my question uh, is related to something that you, you mentioned before, which is about getting things moving. Uh, I've heard that the Toronto, uh, City of Toronto Planning Department has one of the fewest per capita uh, planners uh, in, in any of uh, similar sized cities. Uh, I, although we don't always see eye to eye, I enjoy working uh, with them very much, but I'm wondering if you've started to give any thought to uh, building the planning department. 
I have heard that uh, observation, not the 20% number, but that we don't have the resources to look after things. And I would say two things. I believe I'm right in saying, Jennifer, that while you might want to be able to say that uh, we need more, I'm sure you would, uh, that we did increase, if I write the budget by something in the order of 20% uh, in the last couple of years, there's a very substantial increase. No? Well, you go ahead. Tell us the facts. No, our budget has been decreasing over the past, uh, over the, we, the budget we've not increased. Measured in what basis? On do absolute dollars? On absolute dollars, we've absorbed a few other units. So oh, since 2006, our overall staffing levels have gone down by nine bodies. And am I right that there are presently unfilled bodies in the same department? Uh, while there are, maybe it's gone down by nine bodies, there are actually unfilled vacancies in the department? No, actually, we have a very low vacancy rate. I no, think but it's, are there? I think no. it's at one percent as of today. I was looking over my numbers today. But what you might be referencing, when I started in this position two and a half years ago, uh, there were a lot of vacancies, the gapping essentially. Um, and over the past two years, uh, I've reduced that gapping, so the gapping doesn't exist. So our capacity has increased because we now no longer have vacancies. That has happened over the past two years. All right. And if I was to say to you that we could find a way together. Uh, you and me and many others uh, to uh, expedite uh, the planning process so that we're not having what I has described to me on a regular basis by various people participating in the industry that we might have more capacity then to address uh, a broader range of projects more uh, expeditiously uh, and thus increase capacity. Would you think that's a possibility? Boy, this, is, fun, a long, this is a long conversation I think that we have to have. but. Um, <laughs> You see it here at the ULI, folks. In the debates, where the sausage in the debates, they say to me a yes or no answer would be fine. <laughs> see, city politics is so much better think, than question period, isn't it? I think the answer is yes. <laughs> that was the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? Look, Jennifer, I, I don't mean to put her on the spot, but she took the microphone. So, I mean, I, it's not... <laughs> I believe that we have to have the resources to get the job done. And when I will say that I think we're taking too long to get uh, you know, responsible, careful planning done in an exp as expeditious a manner as you can do it and still be responsible and careful, I think a part of that is the way we go about doing this. And, and it, you know, I describe it as kind of a spin cycle we get on. And I'm not being, uh, by the way, it isn't just the planning department. It's all the other departments that get involved in all of this. And I think what, what I've to been told and I've seen happen is that a question will be asked, that's a valid question, an answer will be given, the departments of the city will consider the answer and then come back and say, well, that's fine, now we have another question. You know, and, and the, the question was meant to be the last one. And, 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 and you go through this, the spin cycle part that requires every department to re-opine after some new matter has come that really is only of interest mm -hmm. to one part of it. And I just, I, I do not think the thing is as efficient as it could be while still being careful and responsible. And if we could address that, then we will give Jennifer and other departments of the city, by the way, more capacity to address things more quickly. And customers will be happier, the, the people who are dealing with the departments, and I think the cost of government can go down too at the same time. I believe that as a conservative, you see. And I mean, when I say a conservative, I mean a small C, because I am a fiscal conservative. I mean, there'll be a lot of things I'll say here that will show that I'm a, I'm a true progressive conservative, as Steve Pakin would catalog, because I have a deep concern about the social well-being of the city, but I also think the government can be run much, much, much better. And I don't think there's been anybody to provide the direction to say we're just going to have to do it. I think there were some attempts made in recent times, but they were... Uh, not followed through on, and I'm, I intend to follow through on those and have you recognize the fact in this room in every respect, whether it's as simple as getting a permit from a park or as complicated as having approved a huge development, that we're going to run the government better. And that that's going to be, and hopefully that will make Jennifer happy because she will have the resources she needs, but we're making darn sure before we add resources that we're making the best use of the ones we have. Yeah. I, I, I just have to really second that as someone who's worked with governments for 30 years. That, that phenomenon you described, you call it the spin cycle, we call it tail chasing, that, that every decision gets reopened at every, at every point when someone thinks of something new. And actually, one of my colleagues is a former principal secretary to a former premier, and he had a rule that once the discussion was done, it was done. And he actually said, if anyone comes back and says, I've been thinking about this, we're going to have a problem. And sure enough, two days later, same group of senior civil servants come back in, and the guy says, you know, I've been thinking about this. He said, I'm sorry, I really have to ask you to leave. And after that, decisions got a lot crisper and tighter, uh, and there were resources freed up for other John, things. here's what I think it's about. And I think that the citizenry and the media, and I mean, I'm, getting, I'm going to get myself in real trouble now when I start sort go, of folks. assessing some responsibility for this. But having said all that, I think public servants have been afraid to make decisions because the environment in which they work now with polarized politics, 
uh, and with uh, more polarization or whatever the word is taking place in the media and even with the social media where you know things are judged so quickly that when you mm -hmm. make a decision it's judged I think it's led to a certain kind of lack of courage um, in government to make decisions and as a result it's easier to commission a study or start asking more questions than to make a decision sometimes and I think we've got to start getting over that because I think it's damaging the city to have things delayed indefinitely um, because you end up with these different kinds of deficits because you just don't make decisions at all. Um, and I think we have to get over that. And I, you see, I, it allows me at age 60, almost 61 now, to, I'm quite serene about all this. I clearly, as you've heard from my comments about uh, Toronto being good for the rest of the country, I'm not seeking office anywhere else. Um, <laughs> but I, I really, it allow, you know, so those of you who are of the same age in this room know that you feel at peace with yourself. I hope you do, and I do. And I just want to try and do what's right. And doing what's right means we've got to start making decisions, showing more courage, and you know, I've been accused of being a person who's indecisive. I'm not at all. I mean, I had to run a huge company where you couldn't afford to sit around and have endless studies. I mean, God knows Ted Rogers would have wrung my neck if I'd been doing that, <laughs> let alone anything else that would have happened, but I just couldn't afford the time. Things were moving too fast. And you just, you, you had to make them quickly and efficiently, uh, but you had to make them. And you, can't, you couldn't be afraid to make them. And you couldn't be afraid of failure. I had stuff that happened on my watch at Rogers that was, were not, the things were not successful. But fortunately, there were far more things that were than weren't. Um, but I think people are afraid of making a mistake and it causes the decision-making process to entirely bog down and you had an expression for it a minute ago at the Waterfront Corporation some of the other day said checkers checking checkers checking checkers you know checking each other's work they're all well, I better check your work and check your work and check your report and read your report and write another report about your report and of course the result is hugely expensive government and decision-making that takes forever neither of which are acceptable in a fast-changing world. So, so this is your checker speech, Mr. President. It's it. Um, for the historians of the group. Maybe we can do this. Can we maybe have, have one or, or two more questions? And then, and then, Mr. Mayor, if you'd be good enough to maybe segue from there into the advice to young professionals. Yeah. Because Happy I to. think we're coming close to the mm -hmm. end of our time uh, together. And I, and I, I want to make sure we touch on that thing because there's a lot of young professional talent here. You can learn a lot from you. But does anyone have a, have a question uh, that they want to? Yes, sir. Can we get a microphone over for this? Sorry, there's down. a man that has been waiting here for it, last Oh, I, absolutely. Okay. Sorry. Uh, good evening, John. My name is uh, Andy Gordon. I, I represent my company. This is Gordon Gupta Group. And I have a question for you. Do you believe that mixed-use development defined in the city's plan is understood by the city, the developer, and the province in creating sustainable development? I'm sorry, I just in the middle of it there, it said mixed-use development, and then you, I just didn't pick up part of what you said. Um, just... Mixed-use development is as defined by the city's plan, is understood by the city, the developers, and the province in creating a sustainable development within Toronto? I don't know, um, but I'm inclined to believe that we're not seeing it as much of it as we should. And, and this leads to, you know, I mean, this leads to, for example, and I, again, I've been on the job for 12 weeks, but I'm astounded already at the instances in which I see people, and I understand, you know, it's business's job to be business, but I, I'm astounded at the degree to which I see people trying to push us to abandon the protection of employment lands, um, you know, which are in the cause of building a community that has mixed uses in, 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 in within its boundaries. Um, and so I'm, and I'm, I'm sometimes of, of the view that it is maybe, if, if you're implying that government doesn't understand what mixed use is, that sometimes business chooses not to understand. You know, because I, I think business people are smart enough, and I think so are government people. I think it's maybe one of those things where people are choosing not to understand it um, because it doesn't suit them, whether they're business people or people in public life. But I think if we want to have sort of balanced communities that are communities of the future, that there has to be mixed-use development. Um, not everywhere all the time. I mean, again, we, we, we seem so intent all the time on having these black or white false choices. But I just happen to believe that, um, you know, that that's the way we're going to build a healthy community, that we're not having all of everything in any one place, um, whatever it is you're talking about. I don't think that probably totally answers your question, because I wouldn't know the answer, frankly, in terms of whether government understands. Uh, what it is. You might suggest I don't understand either, but uh, yeah, you're entitled to that opinion. <laughs> well, uh, now one more question from, from the gentleman with the microphone. Hi, I'm uh, Gary Waddington from Infrastructure Ontario. First of all, I wanted to uh, say it's a real pleasure to have an articulate mayor like you. <laughs> and <laughs> I hope you're still saying that in six months. I, I'm sure I will be. Um, I also, as a lifelong resident of Toronto, I'm really, I want to thank you for actually stepping up and, and running for mayor, and uh, we, I think Toronto had the, uh, the good uh, sense to elect you. Um, 
So my question is, I keep reading in the Toronto Star, all the transit experts, Ed Levy, Richard Soberman, saying about how Toronto's missing the boat by not building the relief line. So what are your transit experts telling you? And are you concerned that if, heaven forbid, there's some natural or man-made catastrophe that shuts down the Young University line, there's no subway into downtown? Well, of course. I mean, that kind of thing, if it was a, a, a catastrophe like that, of course. But uh, let's go back to sort of what I suggested are false choices. Uh, no one has ever heard me, because I've never said it, that I don't want to build the downtown relief line. The observation that I made, and the, one of the reasons when I was presented with that whole list of things I could really sort of put myself behind as a, as a candidate for mayor, that the downtown relief line was on there. And I said, well, you know what, this other one I want to do first because the downtown relief line is a 12 or 15 year project. There's no way it's going to be done any faster. I mean, Jennifer's department had the first, or whoever did it, had the first of a series of meetings last night to start talking about the route. I'm actually ahead of them on Smart Track, even though it's just started, because the route is determined by where there are tracks already laid down, by and large. You know, so that's why this can be done in seven years, and the downtown relief line will be 12 or 15 years. So what I have said very clearly, and now as the mayor and one member of the city council, is we're going to do Smart Track, but we're going to continue with the work on the downtown relief line because it's going to take 12 to 15 years when Smart Track is going to be done in seven. And I think this is part of the problem that we've had as a city. You know, it's one of the things we didn't do as well and wasn't as smart, where we sort of would do one project and then sit back and admire it for four or five years um, and, and not be on to the next one. I mean, the cities that are doing well these days when it comes to public transportation are continuously building public transit. And so I'd like to think that we'll finish Smart Track and maybe about the time it's finished, it will be the time for the construction period of the downtown relief line to begin. So you simply sort of take the talent and the, and the resources and all of that and finish one and begin another. I don't know if the timetables line up quite that way, but I mean, having said all that, that's, so, so I, those who sort of write me up, which they do quite often and sort of say somehow I'm not committed to the downtown relief line. I mean, the downtown relief line is a part of our transit planning that will go forward in the next 15, 20 years. I mean, it's a 12 to 15 year project and there are projects that go beyond that and we should be planning and working on them all because it takes so long to do it. You know, so, and, and with respect to the catastrophic event, I mean, I, we are where we are. It's not necessarily the best place to be for a whole bunch of reasons, leaving aside catastrophic events, to be dependent upon one major kind of north-south. I guess it's really two subway lines now, but um, we are where we are. It's why I want to get on with Smart Track. It's going to represent a north-south, east-west uh, line that crosses the 416 and connects the 905 and will provide an alternative and will, by the way, provide relief to the Young Street subway. Substantial relief. The studies will bear that out. I'm confident of that. And that's one of the other reasons to get on with it. It'll do it in seven years and have that relief available in seven years. So the other advice to young professionals then, other than go into transit planning, you will never go hungry. And <laughs> as long as John Tory is in charge of your town. Uh, let's close out on that. What other advice can you give to some of the, some of the uh, more youthful professionals in the room? I will just say two things, uh, one of which has to do, both of which have, one has to do with the career and the other has to do with the city, but I think they intersect. And, and I'm only basing it on my own experience, but, but it's not just my experience as a person, but it's my experience as an executive who sat and hired and promoted and nurtured and mentored a lot of people over time. Um, what I say to all groups of young people that I speak to is get involved in, 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 in something other than just going to school or going to work. Uh, the way I used to describe it in simple terms, I'd say, well, everybody has a page one to their resume indicating where they went to school. Everybody has a page two in their resume indicating where they've worked, if they've been at work as yet. And then when I used to hire people or be looking for people to recruit to different things I was doing, I would look at what I call page three of their resume. What else did they do in their life? And to me, I'm not being judgmental about whether they decided to devote themselves to athletics or to the arts or to uh, civic action uh, you know, of one kind or another. But I just looked at those people as people of initiative. But I also thought that the odds of them being better rounded people who had developed their leadership skills and who had developed um, management skills and who had taken on assignments, who had failed, um, and so on, were higher than in that fairly cocoonish existence that you go through where you go to school and it seems nobody fails anymore. And you go to, 
uh, you go, that's an old-fashioned point of view, I know, but it's just one I have anyway. Um, and you go to work, and you know, when you go to work, you can end up in a cocoon there too. And a lot of big companies, you can end up in kind of one of those training programs where they sort of protect you from failing for their own sake, um, and so on. So I think page three, you know, I walked into a political campaign room for the first time when I was 14 years old, and I assure you, they put me to work immediately because they were short of people. Volunteer organizations, political parties, charities, arts group, they always are short of people. So if you walk in and you're 14 and you're you know, able to sort of walk in on your own steam and, and converse with them, they'll put you to work. And, and, and the more you do, the more they'll give you to do, and the more responsibility. I ran David Crombie's campaign for mayor when I, I think I was 20 years old. And you know, because I'd been around since I was 14, so I'd learned. And so I just say to young people, get involved. And the second thing I would add to that, which has more to do with the city, I think we need, and one of the proudest things I was happiest about from Civic Action was something called the Emerging Leaders Network, which took young people, younger people in the professional and business ranks and got them engaged in the city. This is a city where we've talked a lot of, about the different challenges that exist for it tonight. I said to the audience last night, and it was a business audience like this of the same number of people, and I think they were surprised to hear me say it, and probably some of my colleagues, including Gary, is surprised to hear me say it because people say, well, you know, you're a conservative. I am. I promise you I'll try my hardest with Gary's help and Denzel Men and Wong's help and so on to run the tightest ship that you've seen in the last 50 years in the city in terms of just value for money. By tight, I don't mean it's going to be nasty or mean-spirited at all. In fact, it's going to be generous. But it's going to be generous in an effective kind of way. But I will say to you, I think the single biggest issue facing the city is not about the development. That's a big issue. It's not public transportation. That's a big issue. We've discussed them all. It is the degree to which we decide we're going to take the decisions necessary and show the leadership necessary collectively to make sure that we don't let people fall behind in the city. And it is a phenomenon going on across the world that the gap between those who are, and, I, and I'm a conservative, okay, I'm a free enterpriser, I'm a business person, I think people should make as much money as they can. But at the same time, I think we have to make sure that we don't let people fall behind and become on the outside looking in. We'll be very sorry because I come back to where I started this evening. The reason I think we rank as high as we do on the lists is, yes, because of our prosperity here and all the rest, but it's because of the way we live together and because we're seen not, to, it's not about handouts to people. It's about making sure you give them a hand up to make sure that if there's somebody who's come here from another country and they're struggling with a language issue or getting their credentials recognized, that we give them that little bit of extra help they need to show what they can do and be fully participating. When we get to 2020, I always say if you don't buy into the moral case, which I'll make, the business case says by about 2020, we're going to need every one of those people to be fully occupied in the economy or we'll be starting to go downhill. But that's not, to me, the main reason we do it. The main reason we do that and address ourselves to that issue meaningfully and in a volunteer capacity, not just as employers and not just as politicians, is because it is consistent with what I think we believe our values are that that is why this is a special place to live, not just because we're prosperous and so on, but because we have sort of established a society in which we find ways to help people to be everything they can be. And so the Canadian dream is a reality, not just some kind of a mirage that's available to a few. And so I believe in my heart that's what's going to keep Toronto great, because that's what's made it great so far. And so I would enlist your help, and I would say to the young people to whom you asked me to offer some advice, that's why you get involved. And you can get involved in any number of fields to do that, but you're doing it with a view to building a great city, which means it's a fair city, as well as a prosperous city and an environmentally sound city and a well-designed city and so on. It's a fair city that gives people an even chance to be everything that we've been lucky enough to be, people in this room. <laughs> well. uh, thank you, Mayor Tory. Um, the luck is really uh, that, of, that of all the folks in this room for, for you letting us uh, look into the, the challenging and fascinating and thoughtful world that you see around you from your position uh, at, the, at the head of council and on that office on the second floor. You've been terribly generous with your time and with your candor. Uh, we're really grateful to thank you properly. Uh, Rob Spanier, who is the chapter head of ULI, is going is to say thanks, but I want to thank you personally. Thank you, John. Thank it's you really very been much. enjoyable as always. How about another round of applause for John Tory and John Duffy? Thank you. I will keep my remarks brief because I think we're just out of time. But over the years, our fireside chat has earned a reputation for getting behind the scenes with some of Toronto's leading region builders. Tonight, I feel like once again, we achieved our goal. So gentlemen, thank you very, very much. Um, as most of you know, the Urban Land Institute is a global not-for-profit organization with its mission to provide leadership in the responsible use of land and in creating sustaining and thriving communities worldwide. 
Like Meritori, we see land as a very powerful lever that can be wielded to deliver strong economic development, better social outcomes, a cleaner environment, and more livable communities. ULI Toronto looks forward to supporting Mayor Tory on his agenda to build a stronger and more pr prosperous city for all of its residents and most importantly a very strong region. Uh, one way we do this is through our relentless focus on solutions and as most of you, what's interesting stat tonight, 50% of you in the room are members of ULI. So I thank you for that. Uh, but we want to do better and we want to welcome all of you who are not members to become members of ULI. We believe we're on an incredible um, we have some great traction and we're on an incredible tangent right now to do some amazing things for the city and for the region and we want to get you all involved. A couple of brief housekeeping notes before I let you all go. Uh, please do join us for the follow-up event uh, to tonight's session, a members only event led by Ian Dobson to discuss Mayor Tory's smart track agenda. Uh, tickets are going to be capped at just 100 uh, attendees. Uh, it is for members only, however on this one evening we're opening it up to members and non-members. The last time we had our last event, I think it signed up by the day after the event, so I strongly suggest you sign up. There will be someone outside if you want to sign up. As well, I want to highlight our first annual Meet the Chiefs Gala on April 7th. Meet the Chiefs is bringing uh, many of the chief or senior municipal planners together from the Toronto region, including Jennifer Keysmat, along with the Minister, uh, Minister of Municipal Affairs and other key officials to, for a special evening to celebrate the private and public uh, sector planning community and our mutual goals to build a better region. With that, I want to say one more thank you to all of our sponsors, as well as Mayor John Tory and Mr. John Duffy, and a very big thank you to all of you for attending this special evening. Good night.